uh, department. Okay. <laughs> and the Department of uh, Material Science and Engineering doing some uh, low temperature physics that you can see on the left hand side of my profile photo with this dilution refrigerator. What many people think that that is the computer, but the computer is actually at the bottom of the chip. And so when I was still a student, I organized the first university Kiske hackathon, which is a hackathon focused on the, this quantum software that made by IBM. And that's also part of the reason I was hired now as a developer advocate. And earlier this year, I also led the IBM quantum challenge, which is an online quantum programming challenge that uh, people can participate and learn uh, how to use the Qiskit software and run real pro uh, programs and uh, experiments on the quantum computers hosted on IBM Cloud, which at the end, I will also going to ex uh, explain a bit more because we have an upcoming one next week. But today's topic is really about, uh, as I, my title promised, that I really love my, making games and I love quantum computing, so I love making games for quantum computers. So these are a few games that I was involved and uh, I also, hope, and I'm going to show some of this here and some of them that actually, uh, some of the latest one actually made with some NUS students through the uh, NUS School of Computing uh, Orbital Mentorship Program, which I'm sure many of you are familiar because most of you are from School of Computing. And then my colleague Chris here is also going to show you a few games. So, uh, so we want to welcome you when I, bring him up as well. Thank you. So with that, uh, now let's dive into uh, today's topic. Why do we care about quantum computing? So you might have heard a lot of news on, a, on newspaper, on, on the internet, talking about the importance of quantum computing. There's many companies uh, investing on quantum computing. And why do we care about this? So you can look at this diagram or Venn diagram, and you can see like the different type of problem that we might solve uh, using computers. So there can be problem that we can already address today using the classical computer. And there's also a bigger set of problem that can be addressed by quantum computers. And then there's also a problem that you can't even know uh, today. So there's an overlap. And here the intersection is what we care. There's some problem that even though how powerful we are supercomputer we have now, it still cannot be solved. And we hope that the quantum computers can bring us advantage and make it more efficient and the solve problem that we can't even imagine today. And the problem could be uh, in the chemistry domain or architecture, you understand the chemical reactions and you can improve the nitrogen fixation process. And then you can create better fertilizers, you can save energy, you can increase the production of uh, agriculture and lower the cost of food. You can also understand a new cat uh, catalyst and you can make the carbon uh, capture conversion in carbon hydrides and make it more efficient and selective. And in terms of finance, you can also do a better financial modeling and then you can uh, understand the economy or, or uh, understand the stock market and try to get a uh, bigger profit. That is why all the banks now are trying to investigate in quantum building and try to apply the quantum building to solve uh, what problem they have and to improve their profit. And also in biology, and especially in this age that we have COVID, uh, it's very important that if you have more uh, bigger and more powerful computational resources to understand the biological problem or the diseases and medicine, discover new medicine, or to understand the mechanism of the certain disease, then it can help us to solve the problem and then save lives. So these are, these are four examples of what we can do potential using quantum computers. But uh, quantum computers are also very difficult to understand and quantum mechanics are very counterintuitive because usually this phenomenon only uh, arise when we go to really extreme condition like very low temperature or very small dimensions. And our real life usually it is uh, still Newtonian like classical physics. So it's often very intu uh, unintuitive for us to understand. And that's why uh, we think that making games would be good to help us to understand some basic concepts of uh, quantum buildings. So, um, so the first game I'm going to show you, which uh, Chris is going to show you a demo later. So uh, this game was made by me and a few people when I attended a hackathon. Now it's already two years, two and a half ago that uh, 
It was the first hackathon uh, made by KissKit you know, community team. And that was in the US. And I joined this hackathon and make this game. And that was part of the reason why I now join the team as well. So it's a very simple game. If you see the interface, it's a coquille pong because it's uh, made after like a very similar to the pong game that you might be familiar with. That you have uh, two uh, components, uh, classical computer on the left, quantum computer on the right. And then you use the quantum computer to uh, uh, play against the classical computer. And on the bottom, it is a quantum circuit, which actually controls the quantum computer. And that is the part that will introduce the quantum computing concept. And uh, I think Chris, if you're ready, I think you can uh, share your screen and then you can share the demo. Great, uh, thanks Jenny. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. By the way, if you have any question, you can always um, send the chat, uh, send a question in the chat and we can answer along the way. And this version that Chris is going to show is a slightly updated version of the one that I show on the screen. This one can be played on a browser. So uh, while Chris is uh, showing you, I'm going to also grab the link and send it in the chat and you can also play with it. Okay, yeah, Chris, please. All right, uh, thanks, Junie. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm an application architect slash software architect for IBM. And today I'm going to present to you, uh, again, a computer game based from an old school uh, ping pong computer game uh, called Pong, now with a twist of uh, quantum. Uh, it has a quantum element in it, hence the name uh, Pew Pong. Right? So as Junie mentioned, it's a simulation uh, of a battle between classical computer and a quantum computer. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so uh, again, uh, on the left is uh, a classical computer and on the right is a simulation of a quantum computer, which can be controlled by manipulating uh, three qubits. Uh, yeah, so uh, for classical computers, uh, we have classical bits. Uh, for quantum computers, uh, we have quantum bits or qubits. So to manipulate the state of the bits, uh, we can put operations in the quantum circuit below, uh, represented by the green area. Right? And then there are lines here uh, where we can place our operation. So each line again represents a uh, one qubit, the bottom line uh, being the first uh, qubit or the first digit in uh, in the qubits uh, on, on the right, right? So uh, currently, as you see, uh, it's going to be if everything starts at zero, zero, zero. And if you want to manipulate, you can put operation. So this is now where um, the concepts of quantum come in, right? So for example, uh, we want to flip the, the value of the qubit from zero to one, uh, we can put uh, an, X, an X gate or an odd gate. So what it does is it just shifts uh, the value from zero to one. So from zero, 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 it now shifts to uh, one, zero, zero. So to control them, uh, you can also put uh, the, X, the X gate on the rest of the qubits and then yeah, uh, it will move, right? So that's one of the concepts of uh, quantum computing. And then the other one would be uh, putting a Hadamard gate. So in quantum computing, there's such a thing as a superposition, where uh, if the, the qubit is in superposition, the value uh, reflected is both a uh, one and zero, right? So let's, let's put a Hadamard gate, for example, so the last one, right? So uh, as you see, right? So zero, 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 and zero, zero, one, because the last qubit is now both one and zero. One thing you also notice here is, uh, once the ball uh, hits the other side, it shifts to just uh, one value because also that's a, a property of, of, of qubits. So once you, you once you do a measurement on a, a qubit that's in superposition, it only reflects a uh, one value. So it defaults to one state. It's either a uh, one or zero. Right. So so currently, uh, classical computer the classical computer is dominating the, the quantum computer. So classical computers still rule the world. But eventually, specific, uh, uh, specifically in problems that are not solvable using traditional computation, uh, we will see uh, in the near future uh, a quantum sup supremacy. So these are for uh, specific problem sets. So that's it for uh, my quick demo. And uh, thank you. And over to you, Junie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for showing the demo. Yes. So I sent a link uh, to, the, to the chat. So if you can, uh, if you're interested to play the game that Chris just showed you, you can just go there and uh, have a look. Yeah. 
So if you have any question, just leave in the chat and I can answer. Uh, I think the organizer will read it out and I will answer them. So this is really a very simple game. And, uh, but I find it very powerful. I present this uh, to many people and many people find it quite uh, intuitive to understand because just by the short uh, playing for a few minutes, you actually understand a few very key concepts like Chris uh, explained. For example, the, so when you put the heart on my gate, you actually create a superposition and making a pedal bigger. So that is one concept, superposition. Another concept is that when the ball reached the, to the superposition board, you actually trigger a collapse and via measurement. This is also a very key concept in, uh, in the quantum computing. And also what is more important below in the, there's a circuit composer, which I'm going to show you in the actual IBM quantum platform. You have something very similar that you can actually build quantum circuit and run quantum circuit on the real quantum computers. And the gate is a concept and the number of qubits and this line with the same qubits. So all these things can be just show and understood in playing the game. So I really uh, encourage you to play uh, using this, um, uh, this game. And uh, I show it, uh, as Chris already mentioned, the bonus of playing this game is that uh, if you manage to beat the classical computer, you will be achieving uh, quantum supremacy or in IBM, we like to call it quantum advantage. And that was before uh, Google uh, achieved this quantum supremacy. It was 2019, so I like to make this joke uh, when I'm showing this. And then um, let me just show you if I can, I don't know whether this show in screen, okay, it doesn't. Let me just show you quickly. So the way that I, this is a special version that, uh, let me cancel my virtual screen, virtual background. So this, uh, the version that uh, Chris show actually, it's not just playable on browser. Uh, it's also playable in some uh, console like this. Uh, this is called, uh, this is called uh, Game Shell. It's a bit like a Linux, uh, bit like a Raspberry Pi machine that is made for game and game development. And the game was developed in a Pico 8, a game engine that's for retro. And then uh, if you run the game that I just showed uh, by Chris, so you can see that it looks like, uh... so I made this for celebrating 30 years and it was sort of Game Boy. And that's why the color is also greenish. In fact, it, it can be color, but I make it just for celebrating the, uh, anniversary, so just something for fun to show you. Uh, yeah, so let's continue. Okay, so that's the first game we show you, and we have two more games to show you. And the next one is, uh, so this, com this game is really uh, kind of old school, like Pong game is already, I don't know, from 1970s. So we know that now the new kids like, like Minecraft, so we also make a game that is a quantum Minecraft for Kisit blocks, which I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. So let me just share. Loading. Okay, so hopefully you can see the game. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I can show you the instruction how to install and load this game later. But basically, if you download and search for the game, you can. Uh, this is called Mind Test, which is an open source version of the uh, platform that is uh, for my uh, for Minecraft. And you can build your own game and own world here. Uh, let me also enable sharing sound. Okay, yeah. Hopefully you can hear the sound as well. So once you enter this game, you see like a room and we already see this familiar gate that we have before, X gate and Hadama gate, but there's many, many quantum gates. But we don't need to read all these instructions here. We just go ahead and have some fun and play games. So I think many of you are familiar uh, with Minecraft. So this is a escape room type of games that we made inside this Minecraft world. And you have many different rooms and with puzzles and you need to solve the puzzle in order to get to the next room. So uh, 
you can have some tools which are the quantum gates that we will need to build in this quantum circuit and this quantum circuit you can see uh, very similar to the coupon you have uh, a line the horizontal which is a qubit and it is initialized into a zero state and what you need to achieve is written on the wall is a state one and as Trace already showed you that there's a quantum gate that is your X, which is very similar to the NOT gate in a classical computer. You just flip zero to one. So as the first first level is very straightforward, you just need to place it and then you can already pass. And then the next level, we have a two qubit example. And the uh, answer, the goal you need to achieve is one zero. And you can see also the color of the qubits are labeled by the color, so you can tell if, uh, very easily what order it is. So for the yellow one, we want to treat zero, so we don't need to do anything. And for the pink one, we want to flip it from zero to one, so we can also put it here and we solve this. So the first few levels are really straightforward and because we want to be friendly. In fact, there's some kids play this, like five years old. Kids can also solve this problem. So uh, that's really good. Uh, so this one is three qubit example is extending from the previous two and you can see zero, one, one. Um, so how do you solve it? I know you're all quiet. So uh, if you want to, uh, in the future, uh, in, there's a few levels left. So if I ask you, if you want to show me an answer, you can just type in the chat. So, uh, so this one is also very straightforward. Uh, Ping one will be zero, so we don't really do anything. But for these two, we want to flip to one, so we can just put this X gate, and then it will flip from zero to one, so we achieve a zero one one. So also far is very basic. So uh, we also added some physical challenge here, so that you get lots of drama, and not just for the quantum part, but also a real physical challenge. Uh, so here is what gets interesting. So. This looks like very much like the first stage. You only have one qubit and one place to put something. But the goal that you want to achieve is very strange. It's like some zero plus one with some coefficient. And there's also something to help you to see this uh, water tank that we didn't pay attention to before. So the water tank actually show you the probability of uh, getting this answer. So previously is full, which means 100%. So without doing anything, the QB is initialized to zero. And so 100%, you will get zero. So what we want to achieve now is 50% chance, because 10 is half full, 50% chance of zero and 50% chance of one. So how do we do that? So that, uh, we can see that in this uh, chest, we only have polymer gate, HK which Chris also show you in the coupon game. This is what we call a superposition state. So you want to achieve uh, zero and one at the same time, or maybe you have heard Schrodinger scan. It can be a uh, dead or alive at the same time before you observe it. Um, so you can just put Hadamard gate. What it changes is from zero, it becomes zero plus one. So that will shows you the superposition. Okay, so the next one. Now we have two gates. So now we need to really need to start thinking. Uh, so you look at the goal we want to achieve is really similar to what we had before, but the coefficient between the zero and one become minus. So what does this mean? So it's still a superposition state. It's still zero and one at the same time. It's still zero and one, 50%. But if you uh, dig into more textbook in the quantum mechanics, you know that this state actually have the have a coefficient that is a complex number, and then it can be uh, any number from uh, from it's a complex, and you can uh, express as a number called e to i theta. It's a complex coefficient, and the theta can be a degree that it go from zero degree to three hundred sixty. So when it have plus, it means that the degree is actually zero. If you pay attention to this arrow before, it was all pointing to this. And that means the angle is zero degree. Now you can see that the angle actually pointing the other side, which means it's 180 degree. And if you uh, do some math e to the power of i 
pi or i 180 degree, it gives you a coefficient of minus. So that's some math in here. But how do we achieve that? So we can try like playing game. You just try an error and see what happens. So let's see. We put Hadamard here. If we put Hadamard gate, we will achieve zero plus one. But you can see that the error is not correct. So we still haven't achieved this correct answer. So we could try. I don't know. What do you think? We give us. What do you think you should you will put here? Oh, Chris, what do you think? <laughs> we try X gate, Alma gate. Yeah. I'm on the chat suggested you. What? You know, um. Okay. So Pete suggested using X, and Ansel suggested using another B. Okay. So let's try X. Somehow I can't see the comment. So yeah, you, you should you should uh, read it out to me. So you put X. What happened? Nothing happened. Because what X does is, so let's walk through slowly. When you get from zero, you put a halama gate, it becomes zero plus one. And what X does is change zero to one and one to zero. So when you have zero plus one and flip them, you become one plus zero, which is zero plus one. So it doesn't change anything. So X is not correct. So what is the other option? Halama gate. It's also wrong, <laughs> and but it's very interesting. So if you have zero, you put halama gate. You put another halama gate. You go back to zero. They cancel each other. And why is that? So what halama gate does is, if you have a zero, you go from zero plus one, and if you start from one, you have zero minus one. So if you can do some math and write, you see that uh, you actually cancel out. So by ex explaining how the Hadamard gate uh, works, actually I already told you the answer. So first we actually need to flip the zero to become one. And once we have the one, and when we do the Hadamard gate, you become zero minus one. So that is just by definition. Uh, but the cool thing is really is when you play games, you actually never really need to think those math in your head. You just try a few things and then you get a feeling. And that is the feeling that is to build your intuition. Once you build this intuition, everything will become like very intuitive. In fact, when you play a lot of games, at first when you play the games, actually very, very complicated. Like if you play, I don't know, Minecraft or you play, uh, I don't know, League of Legends. There's so many, many different things. Playing game is actually more difficult than studying physics, but you always can manage it because you have all these interactions and you have all this feedback that getting to you. And that is the whole point that we want to use gaming to teach people about uh, this. Because once you get the Im impression and the intuition, and then when you go back and read all these mathematical derivation, you see, aha, okay, that is why it happened. So I think the first impression and the interest is the most important. So as for the game, I'm just going to show until here, I will show you five different stages. Actually, there's 16 and Outside of this escape room game, there's also even more games. So I can show you how to install this game and you can try it at home and finish the rest of the uh, stages. I don't want to spoil the fun for you. But what is cool about this game is that it's, it's not just, uh, this is not just a game. If you, um, I didn't show you this cube block before. If you right click it, you actually see some program here. So if you see some code and this code actually can I can use it for building quantum circuit. So we can just copy this one. So now let me share my screen, share my browser. Let me get out of the screen. So now, so this is the website that we can run a quantum program on real quantum website. So uh, maybe I grab it in there in the chat. So uh, I think the organizer already sent you an email or information to a register account here. Uh, if not, you can register now or afterward, that's fine. So if you go here, it's called IBM Quantum 
And that is where you can build quantum circuit and run circuit on real quantum computers. And so let's go back to the game and copy this code. And then we can go to this IBM Quantum Composer. And let's create a new one. And we have Hikers Club. So you see that this is extremely uh, similar to what the quantum circuit in the discrete blocks as well as Qbong show you. So we can just do a, uh, you can build a circuit yourself, but we just build one inside the game. So let's just copy what we built, which is this code called open chasm code, uh, which is a kind of assembly language, or if you know uh, computer science, uh, intermediate representation of the between Python and the uh, actual quantum assembly code. So you can actually delete this and paste this. So this builds the circuit we just built here, which has the X gate and the Hadamard gate. This is the X gate showing on the IBM quantum composer. This is Hadamard gate. And this one identity gate, which doesn't do anything. Uh, we added this just for the game to have uh, no empty circuit. When you have empty circuit, there's some bug that will crash the thing. So the, in reality, the circuit we built is this one. So we can just go ahead and run it. So your copy here, you created a circuit here. You can just set it up. You can choose your quantum computers. So if you register account, you will use this uh, open provider, which give you access to these computers. So there's, I think, eight computers and uh, a few simulators. So if I, okay, you can filter this, but I think you can see, just choose one that you probably have access to. I think this one, or I can sort it by the, how busy it is. So this one is, let me choose. Okay, balance is okay. So you can choose one quantum computer. So this is a real quantum computer and you can add, uh, add the number of short, which means how many times you measure it and then you can name the job. And you can just run it, it's that simple. So once you run it, you directly send to a quantum computer and depending on luck and how busy is the queue, if you are lucky, you can just take like a few seconds, like within one minute, it might be done. Uh, in a busy day, it may take uh, up to one hour. Okay, we are done. So that's really, really quick. So you can see that um, as we learn in the game, that once you put X and a Harama gate, you give you 50, 50%. So when you do it in the real quantum computer, you see that we measure, so we measure 1,020, uh, four times, that's the number of short. I mean, how many times you repeat and you measure. And then you get about 50, 50% 50 of the chance getting this answer. And on the, actually here, you can also see if I remove the measurement, it will show you this 50%. That is by simulation. But as soon as you do a measurement, you will only have one of the outcome. So this is what is showing coupon to show you that uh, there's a collapse in measurement. So if I do the same measurement and I only measure one, I can do same. So it's the same. So just run one more time, the same job. But if you only do one time, you can only see one of the outcome. That is because uh, I think the easiest thing about the cat, the Schrodinger's cat. Uh, Schrodinger's cat, before you measure it, is in a superstition, dead or alive. But in real life, you never see a cat that is both dead or alive at the same time. Because as soon as you observe an object, or in this case, the qubit, you observe it, you collapse. So you never see a superstition. And in this case, you only see one state.
And if I do another time, it might be one, do another time, it might be zero. So in the quantum computer, usually we do multiple times to get like the uh, probability distribution. So when we do 1000 times, then you get uh, very close to the, to the actual value. So that is uh, the IBM Quantum Composer. And I hope that you can try, play the game and then also try it out the IBM Quantum Composer. And that is a very simple way to build a circuit. Uh, maybe I can build one more, which uh, is a bit more interesting. So I can build a two qubit and build a Halama gate. So the, Halama, the one concept that I haven't told you about is called entanglement. So let's also remove this. So the Halama gate generates super precision. And that means one qubit can be in a different state at the same time, zero and one at the same time. And then the C naught gate or this uh, control naught gate will actually generate entanglement between two qubits. What that means is that now the outcome of these two qubits are correlated. So if you look at here, uh, whenever, so we only have zero, zero and one, one, because whenever this qubit is zero, the other one will also be zero. And whenever the other one, this one is one, the other one will be one. So they're always the same. That is what is called entanglement. These two qubits are entangled, so they are strongly correlated. And if you do a measurement, again, you will only show one, but we can do a quick run and a, one on a real quantum computer and you can run it. And if you're lucky, we can also get it done quick. So maybe meanwhile, we can ask, uh, let's see, is there any question? <laughs> this oh, website yeah. gave me a lot of CS for two, six days PDFC. <laughs> Thank you for joining the talk, uh, Ida. Okay. Uh, okay, so we already get this done. Um, so there's one thing I want to show you. So if in the simulation, you only see zero, zero and one, one, but in reality, you see zero, one and one, zero as well. So that's not because of the, our physics is wrong. It's because uh, in the near com or the current quantum computers, there's a lot of noise. So they're not perfect. Uh, there's a chances that because of the environment, you will actually flip the qubits. So zero, zero may become zero, one. Zero, zero may also become one, zero because one of the bits can be flipped by the environment, not because of quantum gate. And that could be caused by anything. So uh, can be temperature, thermal uh, vibration, or it could be a magnetic field. It could be any other things that will actually change the qubit. So that's why um, usually when you see a photo of a quantum computer, you see like this giant machine uh, called a fridge. Maybe I can show you in my profile photo like this. So this is a fridge that can cool the things to really, really low temperature, minus 273.15 degree, very close to absolute zero. And then you put a quantum chip below. And that is to really to cool down so avoid the thermal vibration to, to affect the quantum information. And in fact, error, um, these errors are not so not specific to class, uh, quantum computer. In classical computer, you also have these kind of things. Well, hopefully you'll learn it. So you also need something called error correction when you transmit some, some data. It's just the error rate for classical computer is extremely low now after developing like 70 years. So error rate may be 10 to the power minus four or something. So uh, I can show you one thing that is showing since we already run the computer to IBM Q balance. So we can take a look at this device. So we have all the information about our computer. You can see this computer have five qubits, have quantum volume called 16. I'll explain in a second what that means. It's a measure of how powerful is the quantum computer. So you can see a lot of information. You can see the error rate is pretty high compared to classical computer, like minus two. So one in a hundred, you have some error. And then you have different kind of error. The CNO gate have error without have error. And there's also something called T1 and T2 is the coherence time, meaning how much the quantum information can exist 
in this quantum compute qubit. And the time is extremely short. The time is less than one millisecond. It's a hundred microsecond. That means every computation now need to happen at this time. So actually you show that the drop takes like a few seconds when the actual circuit um, took about uh, maybe 10 microseconds, you can have a look. But we repeat 1000 times. So uh, you can see that we have 1000 times and the actual time that spent on the system was three seconds. There's also other time spending like queuing, uh, doing other stuff. So yeah, so if you register and try something out, you can learn a lot of concept of uh, very advanced concept of quantum computing just by first playing the game and then maybe play a little bit with the composer, then you can actually get exposed to a lot of advanced concept. And hopefully when you get more serious about quantum computing, then you can find that all these things start to make sense because actually there's a lot of uh, concept and frequency of qubit, signal and error, uh, different kind of gates and the qubit, how they are connected. All these things you can yeah, get exposed to. Which at the end of the talk, actually, I will guide you to some of the information to how to take a deeper depth, a deeper dive into quantum building. So, yes. So, I have one more game to show you. Uh, but before that, let's see if you have any questions. Any good books or resources? Okay. Yeah, I will show you at the end. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So, let's continue. So I'll show you coupon, I'll show you the Minecraft, and I want to show you this game that is the latest game that I made with uh, two NUS students and through the Orbital Mentorship Program. I hope most of you are familiar and it was just happened over this summer. And so these two students, Barath and uh, Tichin, they are year two students now, they were year one. And, and so they approached me and then uh, we met in some other events and, I told them about the quantum games and they are very really interested in quantum building. So they think this is a good opportunity for them to learn deeper on quantum building and game development. So uh, they really like tower defense games and we have never made any quantum tower defense games. So we want to uh, also similar to Cubone and Kiski blocks to use a new tower of game to introduce some concept that uh, by, hopefully by now you are familiar with superposition and, uh, and probability and measurement. So I can also just uh, share with you. Let me launch the game and share my screen. Let's close this one first. Can you hear the sound? Yeah, so this is a very fancy graphics and we can play a tutorial maybe. So uh, this is a tower defense game and uh, what you want to do is to protect the two portals. You don't want the enemy to enter and uh, attack the portal and kill the, kill the portal. And then there's two colors of the enemies and also the portals. So when they, the enemy can only uh, will be attracted to the portal from the same color. And also uh, the towers also have color. And the towers can only hit the enemy of the same color. And all these towers actually can be, uh, actually the, internally they also have quantum circuit and you want to put some quantum gates inside the tower so to enable some special effect. For example, um, so some strategy you can have is that maybe the, the blue one have more health and the red one have less health and you want to direct all the enemies to the blue one or the opposite. And so you can, by doing this, by uh, adding the gates, like the Halama gates, you can actually, 50% uh, of chance you can flip the color of the enemy and direct them to the opposite side. And you also have rotation wide, we have 87%. 
or the X gate actually can be 100% flip the enemy and then they will all direct it to, to the other side. So there's a health bar and uh, some towers and the gates and money. So yeah, these are just tutorial. I can just directly go to level one and show you how it works. So now, as I explained, you have two portals. You have the blue one and the red one and the tower, you can also switch color. And so you have the enemy blue. And for this stage is for really also a tutorial. All the enemy will be blue. So what you really want is to direct the enemy to this side because of all these spikes and you have a very high attack and you can kill all the enemies. And if you only build towers, you are not going to handle all these blue enemies. So what you really want is to add a column gate here. And which case should we... Okay, I already died. <laughs> uh, let's start. Um, so which case should we put? If you want to... Uh, if you want to return more enemy to back this side. So I, want, I hope people can reply. Uh, let's see, I can like anyone, which case should I put, Alma gate or X gate? If I want to make more enemies back, so if you can try, you can put Alma gates and you'll see that sometimes the enemy become red. Okay, we got lucky, everyone become red. So they all go back and they will be killed. But you see some of this, when they attack, they are still become blue. So you will still be attacked and you probably will die. So let's start again. Okay. So what you really want is to build a lot of blue tower. And then you put a X gate. But you are limited by the gates. You also need it by the money, so you need to cannot build too many towers. But hopefully this one will be enough. So whenever the enemy comes here, you'll be attacked by this tower once. And with the X gate, you actually 100% send the enemy back. So by one tower, you can already protect this blue. And because of the high spikes, you can guarantee that the enemy will be all killed. So there's many stage on this game, so I just encourage you to to uh, play that. And yeah, so let me share that now. Okay. okay. Any questions at this point? Okay, there's no, okay, then let's continue. So these are the three games I show you. I hope you have some fun. And uh, there's also a link here. I'm going to send you a link to the presentation. You can see all this information and you can download the games and try it later. So just really want to shout out these uh, brilliant students. And uh, th the game they make is much higher uh, standard than the two games that I made before. You can see this is a full-fledged game and they only develop in two months. And you can really see that the people from School of Computing is a whole different level than compared to me. That is like, a, uh, it's not a real developer. Um, so actually there's many, many quantum games and uh, these games are not made by me, but in the community, in the Kiski community, there's a lot of people make games. And even including this one that you can see is a card game. It's not a computer game and you can play, it's also pretty fun. And so you can also click here, it's a GitHub repo that I made called Awesome Quantum Games that you can find many of the quantum games that is available and you can play with them. So at last, I just want to show you uh, back to a bit more serious topic that about the future of quantum computer. And this is the roadmap we released in, from IBM Quantum to show you the direction in the next few years in terms of hardware and software. So at the bottom, you can see that these are the IBM Quantum systems and how we plan to scale them up. So right now we're in 2021. We are going to release the, this Eagle 127 qubits later this year. And right now we already have 
com computer that is 65 and 27 qubits. And in three years, we want to be able to achieve 1000 qubit with Kondo. And beyond that, we will may have multiple different uh, chips that they can be linked by different ways and together they can be 1 million qubits. And with 1 million qubits, hopefully we will have enough computational power to demonstrate quantum advantage that is uh, solving some problem on a quantum computer that is more efficient than a classical computer. And more interestingly is also mostly for the audience that is from School of Computing. So you can see on top of the hardware, we have a different type of developer, kernel developer, algorithm developer, model developers, and they're going higher and higher levels. So we aim that in 2023, we can make the Qiskit, uh, the quantum software we have to be very intuitive and frictionless that whatever you are doing today, we can easily just install Qiskit and the application module and just a few lines of code, you can switch your existing uh, software and use a quantum computer at the back end. So some example would be uh, optimization, which uh, in classical we have uh, Cplex is a optimization software made by IBM. And right now we can already just by a few lines of code, you can switch calculating using a classical computer or a quantum computer. And for similarly, we have this for like natural sciences, finance and machine learning. And, but for now we have already application modules. And in a few years, we'll build this pre-built quantum runtimes that you can, a bit like if you're familiar with AWS, uh, there's a lot of services or IBM cloud, there's cloud services that you can already pre-build and you can just choose some models and then configure them and you can run and calculate simple things that already uh, exist as a whole package. You can just change some parameters and solve your own problem. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, there's going to be IBM Quantum Challenge for 2021 next week. And this is a 10 day challenge that you can try to learn the KISS kit, which I didn't show you. I only show you the IBM Quantum Composer, uh, but you can also use a Python software that can send more complicated package, uh, complicated problem. So not everything it can be built by just drag and drop. So if you want to solve more complicated thing, you can use a Python. Uh, application uh, Python software called Qiskit. And this challenge is going to teach you how to use the latest Qiskit application modules, like the one that I show you on the previous slide in nature, finance, machine learning, and optimization, and solving the real life problems. So if you are interested, I encourage you to register. Special part about this is we reserve a whole quantum system just for the challenge. So during this challenge, you have a, full quantum system just for all the participants. And so make sure that we have a very short queue time and you can execute all the pro, uh, program that you write and to calculate them. So that's the end of the talk. I just, these are some links that you can go to check on Kiske YouTube. Also, if you're interested in joining uh, the quantum industry, there's also some career resources that you can find. Uh, we have career talks, we have internships, and you can also see what kind of jobs are available in the quantum industry. And then maybe you can think about how to prepare yourself to become a quantum developer or a quantum researcher. And yeah, so with that, I finished my presentation and I can answer some questions. Yeah, okay. Okay. Hi everyone, um, feel free to just uh, send questions in the chat. So the first question from Trudinger's cat is where can we register for the coding challenge? The IBM? Yes, great. Yeah, great question. So maybe first I send you the links to the slide. Let me stop the presentation mode. Let's send this one. Sure. So you can all see the slide here. And then uh, you will see all the information that I show you today. Uh, the link is short link this challenge 421. I will also going to show you, send to you. And there was a questions about the textbook. So uh, someone mentioned Mike and Ike. Yes, that is the, the Bible for quantum computers. 
but uh, I personally prefer Kiski textbook. Not because I'm from Kiski or I do in quantum. It's just because the uh, the Mike and I or the introduction to quantum information and quantum computation by uh, Michael Nelson and Isaac Chang. So that is a very classic uh, textbook, but it's a very physics heavy book. And I know the audience here is very uh, computer science focused. So you might find that book quite difficult to follow. And also it's really focusing on the variations and the algorithm they show are pretty pretty old and there's a lot of development since then so let me see how I can go so if you go to kiskit.org and there's one place you can see learn and you can see a lot of learning resources here so my favorite textbook is kiskit textbook which is an open source textbook uh, yeah here yeah. So open source textbook that use uh, Jupyter Notebook and all the code. And uh, so if you do, yeah, I'm going to send the name of the textbooks in the chat later. So I'm just going to show you the textbook. It's all interactive, all web-based. So, um, and we just recently released this beta version that is really awesome. That's extremely interactive. You can see a lot of illustrations. You have multiple questions. You have, uh, you can run CoSAL directly on the browser. And on the sidebar, you can also see a lot of different descriptions. And if I can find one that is more co-heavy. So you see these are directly uh, a cell that you can run and it's using Python from Qiskit import quantum circuit and how you build a circuit. So all these things can be interactive. And I think it's really great way to learn because you can try something and then run it and try it. While in the classical textbook, you need to read it, understand it, and then you derive by your hand. And still you don't know how to build a quantum circuit and send to a quantum um, computer. So let me just grab the link to this one. Maybe the learn is good. So, so the, the classical textbook is this one, quantum introduction to quantum. I'm typing in chat. Yeah. And there's also other learning thing you can see. Coding with Kiski is a YouTube series that is also uh, pretty good. You can watch it and walk through and follow along. And but I would like to also show this one, which is um, what we had for the uh, summer school in 2020. And actually this was conducted in two years, uh, two weeks intensive, but it's equivalent to a one whole semester quantum computing course. So we have all the videos on YouTube and also lecture notes, and also a lab, which is a Jupyter notebook with all the code. So if you want, you can just watch the video and follow along and teach you a lot of things from the most basic, what is qubit, qubit state, quantum circuit and measurement that I show you through the games, but you can, learning more uh, rigorously by taking this course, how to write programs and uh, learn some more quantum algorithms. And the most famous one for Schwartz algorithm, which is what ignited whole field in 1994, that showing the quantum computer can crack the ISA uh, cryptography. So there's many things, error correction. Also, if you can learn uh, some more physics, how to make a qubit and how does the, one of the qubits, superconducting qubit works and also application using quantum computer to solve a chemistry problem. So I think that's pretty good for the learning material. Any other questions? I think uh, we can take like one last question um, that Jenna had posed um, about what, like, what are the near term real life applications of quantum computing that can't be done by classical computers? Hmm. So I mentioned a few questions. So these are very, um, still very active field of research. So uh, it's not certain that we know which ones are better or which one will be first. So these are a few examples. And I think chemistry is one that we think in the field that is uh, more certain that it have advantage. Uh, and that's in snow since the beginning of quantum building, if you read about Richard Feynman, uh, because quantum, or chemistry or the quantum systems and the molecules 
they are described by quantum mechanics. And to simulate the quantum mechanics, it's better to use a quantum mechanical computer than a classical computer because to encode all these uh, electrons and uh, atoms using a classical computer is exponentially more complicated because you need to store a lot of information. While using quantum computer, you can kind of, you can think about it like using one qubit to uh, simulate one electron. So in that way, it will be easier to scale while you, you simulate classical computer, it's exponential to the power of n or four to the power of n uh, resources. So if you calculate a molecule that is actually caffeine molecule, we cannot simulate a, a full accuracy today using classical computers. But we might be able to do that with quantum computers. But uh, so chemistry is one of the big areas. But there's also other areas that finance, optimization, and machine learning people are exploring. And uh, but there's no proof that they will be better. At the specific to problems, uh, but something like finance, yeah, as long as you can demonstrate, like we don't have mathematical proof, but if someone can demonstrate, then it's already generated a lot of values because usually they talk about billions of dollars. If you are faster in doing certain thing or more accurate in doing some modeling, you generate a lot of money. That's why the banks actually are one of the most um, advanced company joining the quantum computing and trying to explore more application because of the money they, they have by doing a uh, better computation. Yeah. I saw one question about- um, uh, Jenny, how uh, does... sorry, uh, could we uh, like, cause- if... Yeah, I saw the time already, yes. Um, but if you want, you can, um, we can still answer questions in the chat um, if that works. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I'll just type it in the chat and we can continue there. I'll just answer two questions, yeah. Okay, this is great. Yeah, Great. thanks so much for the talk, uh, Junior and Chris. Um, I think I speak for the whole audience that this was a very fun talk. Um, yeah, I really didn't know that you could make a tower defense game um, apply for the <laughs> principles. But yeah. yeah, that is really cool. And especially that that yeah. was an orbital project. So um, thanks so much. Um, and yeah, feel free to uh, hang around and answer questions. Yeah, I'll hang around like for a few minutes, answer the question that I couldn't answer in the talking. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And yeah. We will out stay and then yeah, answer any questions. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, so that was our first talk uh, about exploring quantum computing through gaming. I hope that was as fun for you all as it was for us. Um, so anyways, we'll be moving on to our next talk about lin uh, about linting and uh, lint rules in Dart. And our speaker for that talk is um Jeff Cole. And Jeff, oh hi Jeff. So, so I'll just briefly introduce Jeff and then um, pass over the time to him. So Jeff is, in, is a software engineer at Google working on the client architecture team for uh, Google Pay. So he's also an, a recent, uh, he's also an NUS graduate. So yeah, and he'll be talking about uh, linting and Dart and how he has used it um, for his work. So I'll just hand over the time to him. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks everyone. Hey. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Jeff. Also, thanks, Jin Yuan, for that talk. It was a really interesting talk. So uh, I'm Jeff. I'm from the Google Pay Client Infrastructure team. I'm here to give a talk about LinkedIn and Dart. Uh, please be patient with me because I don't know how to share my screen. <laughs> it has been a while since I used Zoom. <laughs> Let me see this. OK. Do you guys see a, yep. see a screen? See okay. A... Great. So I hope this is the right screen. OK, so LinkedIn and Dart, we're going to learn how to automate chores. Uh, specifically, we're just going to look at how Dart can be used to automate chores. I'll be taking this from a more of a software engineer SUI, otherwise known as SUI kind of perspective, rather than a language developer, a compiler developer, because frankly, I'm not an expert in languages. Please feel free to fact check me. For those people who take courses in like programming languages, I'm pretty sure uh, you guys know more about this than me. So what I'm trying to impart here, oh wait, sorry. Uh, what I'm trying to apply here is uh, probably just more of a software engineer perspective. So who? So this is who I am. I'm Jeff. Uh, I work in Google Pay. I'm a generalist three, which means I don't uh, say focus specifically on anything yet. And most people in Google, they end up being generalist three. Like they, they will have a lot of experiences in particular areas. But uh, as far as uh, as far as I know, we pretty much are happy like delving into any areas. So. Uh, I have less than 10 months experience. So again, not very experienced, just a fresh out of school. So please bear with me if, that's, if some of this stuff may seem like super obvious to you. Yeah, like, 
again, some people here might have a lot more experience than me from their internships. Okay, so uh, let's see. So this is why you shouldn't listen to me <laughs> because custom lit rules for Dart is not supported yet. So I think there's another language uh, Go where you can write custom lit rules, but specifically for Dart, this is a feature that's still not, that hasn't landed and is an open issue for quite a while. So while you learn and understand why we want to create lint rules and how and what's the general approach to doing it, it's not something that you can do immediately out of the box, at least not with that. Uh, okay, so I don't really know what I'm doing because uh, linting in that is not something that I work on all the time in Google Pay. Google Pay is uh, was an application and the folks at Dart that I've been working with, they are the ones who know about this a lot more. So uh, do take what I say with a pinch of salt. And again, I might be wrong here and there. I still copy paste code. I'm literally not an engineer from Dart. And sometimes sleeping is more productive than listening to me. So this is why maybe you should listen to me. I have some bad experiences here and there as an engineer working with a super large code base and a lot of engineers worldwide. So what I'm about to share here will probably be a perspective about uh, just working with your code changing all the time, having to uh, deal with the fact that you need to catch errors in, in reviews even though you're not awake. So this is where lending might come in useful. Okay, so the content I have laid out for this talk, and I think we probably will finish ahead of time, but uh, we're gonna do some quick introduction, so that's already done. I'm gonna cover what a linter is. Uh, I'm, then the bulk of this talk will be about why we want to lint. So you notice that the last 10 minutes of the talk, why, how do we lint in that and uh, writing lint rules will be very, very short because I think, uh, okay, so for the third section, you can actually kind of read it by yourself. Like uh, the Dan wrote a pretty good documentation how you can in, in, enable certain lint rules in your project and how you can customize the lint rules. So that's not too important here. And I think they do a much better job at explaining this. Now, as for the last bit, writing lint rules, I think it's a pretty interesting process because you learn to appreciate how lints are being written and you learn to appreciate what are the limitations of lints, what can they do and what they can't do. Uh, however, I don't want to delve too much into it because I can't teach that much. Plus, even if I can teach you how to write a lint in Dart, uh, you can't write a lint in Dart. Uh, yeah. So uh, to give a bit more context, when you write a custom lint rule in Dart, you would have to edit the Dart SDK. And in order for you to then use that custom lint rule, you have to then re-roll the SDK, uh, sorry, you will have to recompile the SDK and point all your applications that are built on that SDK to build based on that new SDK. Uh, in other languages, I think it is much simpler. You don't need to recompile your SDK. You can simply write the rule and then the current SDK can just look at this file. Oh, cool, I got a new lint rule. I can apply this lint rule. Uh, sadly, I think that's not uh, what we can do here for that. Yeah, uh, but I can't teach this in any other languages because this is the, the one rule which I, the, the one language which I start writing lint rules in. So the content not covered, what is Dart, what is Flutter? Uh, so, so Flutter is just a framework that uh, is frequently associated with Dart. We will be covering that. Implementing data flow analysis, implementing a linter, uh, explaining how IDs process the lints and how to lint other languages. So I just want to be clear that we won't be learning how to implement a linter. That itself is very, very hard. And uh, I definitely don't have the required knowledge to teach you how we can implement a linter in Dart. We'll learn how we can write lint rules and we learn how to use linters, but we won't learn how to create one, okay? So if this talk is not for you, I completely understand. And uh, I'm totally fine if you leave the talk at the moment. Yeah, so at any point in time, you feel like this is uh, something which you already know or you don't have uh, further questions on, I'm totally fine if you decide that, hey, uh, I already know this and I'm gonna spend a Friday doing something else. <laughs> okay, so the key takeaways that I would want you guys to have is um, I want you to understand limitations of lens and what they're good for. I want you to be able to know if a problem can be solved by lens and if you can approach this from a perspective of, hey, I need to fix this, let me write a lens. And then afterwards, the, the, the stuff in the green, so I try and color code things, the stuff in the green section, you will be able to set up lens provided in your own Dart project and you can justify cost setting up lens versus not setting up lens. But like you can see that, okay, cool, this is only gonna take five minutes. And this is a cost of not setting up lens. Am I gonna do it or am I not gonna do it? And I think this kind of stuff and this kind of uh, uh, trade-off is probably stuff that not, this isn't really a trade-off, this is more of just like a 
you know, it, five minutes is not exactly that much of a trade-off. But this kind of a weighing pros and cons and the heavy cost-benefit analysis of whether you should do something or not, I think be valuable for, for you as an engineer. So probably going to focus a bit more on the whys and hows of this. And then the last bit, uh, writing a LIN, I just want to give you appreciation on how LINs are implemented and more understanding what LINs can and cannot do. I think going through an example is the best way for you to know if your problem can be solved by LINs because you've seen a LIN. Okay. Okay. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to hand with a few things. I'm going to generalize a few things. I encourage you to nitpick them uh, during Q&A. Uh, but there's a limit to my knowledge. I'm not sure. And if I'm not sure what the answer is, I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, if you're asking me questions now, I, I'm not seeing that because I, I don't know where the chat is in, in Zoom. But uh, oh, weird. but yeah, uh, I'll definitely pick them up during Q&A. So first off, what is a linter? So linter is a static analysis tool. Static analysis means that you analyze this at compile time. So essentially it's a tool that runs uh, while that well, a tool that runs before the runtime. And it essentially only has information that is noble at compile time. So it tells you what's wrong with your code as you write your code. So example is over here. This is a lint where it says the form, the method underscore format isn't used. So this is probably pretty useful for programmers because uh, this is kind of like a code smell. When, some, when you write a method that isn't used, you either don't need the method or uh, you forgot to use it. And this is pretty, I would say this is pretty useful for people because it helps people write better code. It helps people write code faster. And that and you don't need to go through the process of the back and forth code review. So how do they work? So as I said before, it's a static analysis tool. So it only possesses knowledge about the code that is knowable at compile time. So um, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was quite confused about what compile time and runtime is. So I'm just going to spend a bit more time elaborating. At compile time, so compile time refers to uh, the stage where your code is being compiled by a compiler. Uh, you're not running stuff yet. And, uh, and one of the key examples I can, I can think of right now is, so if you have code, so, or you have objects that are of the type any, or it's a dynamic type, or it's untyped, at, run, at compile time, you wouldn't know what kind of type this object has. But, oh, sorry, at compile time, we don't know what kind of uh, type this object has, but at runtime, when the object's being evaluated, uh, it's being passed around and you evaluate that thing, you know what the type is. So that's at runtime when the program is running. Yeah. So let's think about what's knowable at compile time. So typically you know about the code structure that's both synthetic and semantic. On the right, we have an AST and essentially this is a breakdown of a while loop. So an AST stands for abstract syntax tree and typically it is the compiler's representation of the programming knowledge, uh, sorry, the programming language. And you do have knowledge of like uh, the while loop, the while loop has a branch, the, the branch has a, a sign statement, things like that. So you have knowledge of this syntactic structure. And you also have knowledge of the semantic structure as well. What, what kind of type is this? What kind of a class is this? Stuff like that. So linters can act on any information that's known by compile time and it's very powerful as a result. So this is the documentation for Dart's uh, analyzer that looks at the AST side of things. So they, you can typically look at, sorry, so the classes would let you know that they are well adjacent strings, annotated node, annotation. These are all the different stuff you can look at and poke around to write your lit rules. And uh, this is a grammar of the, of the Dart language. So typically because your syntax, the syntactic information is tied very closely to the grammar, the kind of like, the kind of syntax information that you can access is probably best understood by looking at the grammar or the API documentation, depending on which one is uh, more accessible to you. So semantics refer to meaning, a class element, a constructor element. Sorry. This information uh, is encapsulated as like meaning of, of, the, of the code. And there's, they don't exist as much in the structure as they do in uh, you know, just meaning alone. So you have a combination of both syntax and semantics to work on in order for you to write your lint rules. Like for example, if I see this class uh, list, then I fire lint rule. Don't use list in this project. So semantics, typically they are something that's collected when you're populating your symbol table. So that's just a different, uh, a different part of the process in your compiler. So I'm diving the text to like give me a higher level view. And I think this is the higher level view. So compilation, 
usually you have a lexer, a parser, you could have code generation, and then afterwards you run stuff. I'm just going to show these three stages because uh, I think beyond that, it is probably not as important or like understandable. So Lexa is where you tokenize things. You take in all the code, you go through a Lex Lexa, they tokenize it with different tokens. And then with the parser, you pass things out. You take all the words, you look at them, and then you say, okay, this is a while loop, this is an if branch, this is what else, whatnot. That's synthetic analysis. And then after you pass it, then you can put it through semantic analysis, or you can do semantic analysis while you're passing too. So this thing's whole this uh, diagram is a generalization of uh, the compiler stages. Uh, they can implement it any any way they want, but generally it's a lexing passing kind of stage followed by semantic analysis, code generation, uh, they putting in the machine code optimization, etc. Okay. So uh, this is also not a diagram of like God's compilation process. It's just a very high level view of what a compiler might be like. So because your compiler does lexing, passing, do all this analysis, uh, it has all this information available, right? And that's why it does like, cool, you know this. I, therefore, I also know this and I can act on this. So why do we live? You want to tell people what's wrong with their code as their code. And you don't want to tell them to, like later on when they submit their code. And this is very, very useful because changes that happen earlier are the least expensive. I know. So we also want to figure out why you want to tell people that they're, they're wrong, right? So we the reason why we uh, want to tell people they're wrong is because we, we don't like the code. And this why we don't like the code is kind of really, really subjective. Sometimes it's, it's due to style. Uh, you just really don't like the way they, they write the code. If you write code like this, uh, there's a very high chance that your that whoever is your your the person looking at you in the code review will probably reject this code. Uh, correctness, redundancy. So sometimes you have code that is redundant because this if branch, it will always fire with skip lecture. So there's no need to write don't skip lecture. This is un unreachable. It's never attainable. And you should just write your, you're going to skip lecture and it's a lot clearer in terms of intention and also it reduces you know, redundancy in code. And here's the last reason that I think is less common. So you want to harden your code which means you want to create a more secure API. You don't want people to ever write log user dot credit card number. So uh, I don't know whether this is something that you can completely solve with like lint alone, but if your lint can do something like this, it's extremely useful because this means that uh, throughout code review, you never have to go through, uh, look through at the code and wonder, hey, do I have PII concerns? PII means personal, personal identifiable information, not too sure, but you don't, you won't leak private information. And that saves your, save so much time in the development process because you don't need to go through such extensive code review and you, well, you're basically save on manpower time. Okay, so one to four is quite, I would say, uh, intuitive. So I'll just let it, let you guys read it. But five to six, it, they're kind of stuff that I picked up on the job. Uh, so when you tell people they're wrong in code review or when people tell me that I'm wrong in code review, sometimes I'll push back. I'll ask them, why? Why is this wrong? Uh, is there a style guide for this? Uh, and it's not because most of the time, I would say it's not because people want to push back, people want to say that uh, the other person is wrong, but it's because we need to all agree on a single authoritative source to make sure that if this person pushes back, everyone else is going to push back on the same thing for the same reason. So if let's say he's pushing back on style, uh, everyone else will also push back on, on this particular style and you'll be cohesive throughout the code base because it doesn't make sense if this one person say, hey, you got to use a uh, snake case. And then you agree. And the other person say, you got to use camel case. So when you have a lint, you know that this lint applies throughout the whole code base. And therefore, it is a single authoritative source. It is universal. And you don't need to push back. It is for sure correct. And I think sometimes, which happens a lot less, is that people can take it personally. So ego is definitely a thing, no matter how much we try to unbiased ourselves. And you, you might find it harder, especially if you are a junior engineer, and to tell a senior engineer, hey, you, you really shouldn't be using two underscores in, in this language. Uh, that's something that we only use more in, in Python or, or in Java, but not in, say, language X. So sometimes it's hard to do the correct thing because uh, there's this power dynamics, and also you're afraid that people might take it personally. Oh, oh no, what's, how is this going to affect my performance review, things like that. So ha having delegated to a linter makes things so much easier.
So what's my problem? What's the problem that I'm trying to solve with this? So this is my personal problem. I'm going to skip that. Uh, the problem that we really want to solve is privacy and security. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have this kind of stuff in uh, that this kind of like code pattern that that we generally have in the sorry that that came out as gibberish. We generally have this kind of uh, function calls. Make we make a DB call. We take in some parameters in the method, and uh, then we just kind of like make a query, a, a direct raw query, raw query, a direct query to the database. So some of you might have noticed at this point that this could be a potential security problem because you deal with, uh, I think, SQL injection. You could have some error, errant string doing weird stuff. And because we are a client facing application and we do get stuff from clients, I don't know if there's any text fields that go directly into the SQL, into a database call, but people can inject things. And when we do security reviews, we also want to make sure that this DB call is probably not subjected to any SQL injection. So second reason, uh, we lock stuff, right? Like we lock stuff to our servers all the time because we want to co collect useful information on why things crash. So this could be kind of problematic if let's say if we accidentally lock your house address, your personal credit card number, your name, things like that. We don't want to lock things like that. Uh, so in order for us to properly write a lock call, in our code, sometimes we have to go through review and have to be have people discuss, hey, and trace through the code. Hey, yo, this log, this this log info method, it takes in all this like log messages from places. Can this log message ever be you know sensitive? That takes a lot of time. So here's the inspiration between it. Essentially, a function, well, it's a, it's a function. It it has a domain. It has a range. It takes things in from a domain. So what is the domain of, uh, of all the functions that we're, we looked at just now? You have good values and then you have like all the values and all the values can contain funky stuff like drop tables, my phone number, things like that. We want to restrict that. And the intuition here is compile time constant is a smaller subset of uh, good values. It essentially, me, what I'm trying to say is at compile time, you won't have uh, user generated SQL strings. At compile time, you probably want to have uh, at compile time, the strings that you pass into log info probably won't be also user data because they come straight from uh, the, the, the code that you compile. And user data probably comes from like some DB call or some uh, or being fetched from some server. So with this inspiration, uh, we can potentially write a lint that is uh, that essentially says must this thing must be a constant. So if this thing must be a constant, then we can whenever reviewers look at this method and they see oh cool it must be a constant. I don't need to trace the code everywhere to see if this parameter will ever be subjected to SQL injection. I don't need to trace the all the objects being passed into this method to see if they can ever be someone's phone number, and that makes things super duper fast. That gives you confidence in your code. And that makes people more likely to write uh, better log, uh, to provide more logs because now they, they don't have to be subjected to the process of having that code nitpicked to make sure that uh, they will never leak PII. Okay, so here's the impact. Uh, I think I went through it already. And the feasibility of the lint, I think that's, that's something that uh, would be more interesting to discuss. So we know the constant values are subset acceptable values, and we know the analyzer knows where the value is const. So why do we know that? So in the Dart language, uh, the const the const keyword is baked into the language, and uh, you kind of can put uh, one and one and two together and have the intuition to say that okay, this const thing is probably either present in the as a syntactic. Info, as a form of syntactic information or semantic information for the programming language. So because of this, you probably know that you can make a lint like that. 
So that's kind of decision making process we went through. Okay, we want to have compile time constants, but can we do it? Oh, cool, that's cons. Okay, yeah, right. We we can definitely do this. So lists are great. How do I get that for my dot project? So there's these two two things here. Uh, I think they're pretty good guides. I can go through them briefly. Let's see where at time. Twenty one minutes, six twenty three. Uh, you know what? Why don't we come back to this if we have time? Because I think they're quite self, uh, self-explanatory when you read them, and it's not that complicated. Okay, so why do I want to write in? This is the issue I created uh, with regards to must be cons. Okay, so I want to talk about must be cons, uh, and I want to show you how it's implemented, but it's not open source at the moment. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to show you how lint is being written with a different lint. So I picked something that's similar to must be cons, unnecessary const. So the context behind this is that there's something called constant context in Dart. So constant context is a regional code in which it isn't necessary to include the const keyword because it's implied by the fact that everything in the region is required to be a constant, which means that you don't need to put a const uh, keyword in attached to that node or attached to that uh, expression because implicitly it will be const. So for that reason, uh, we, there's this lint. Uh, these are a few places where you could potentially have, sorry, these are a few places where you need to watch out for, where you could have uh, potentially unnecessary cons. So cons, constant context, if you, if you change this variable to, to a cons, everything on the right-hand side is understood to be cons in a constant context, and you don't need this cons. So that's essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, for those unfamiliar with const, just think of it as a, as a keyword that modifies the, the value or the expression. It's, it's not the same cons as uh, the cons you see in C. So Dart's cons is a bit different. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So hmm. when you try and design a lint, you have to first think about the different cases, right? So looking back at this, you have to deal with a uh, list, you have to deal with uh, What's this? This is an object. You deal with objects. You have to deal with, hmm. oh yeah, you do initializers, annotations, expressions. Essentially, when you think about it, and I think this comes with a bit of uh, experience on the on the language itself, you you break it down to three cases. So like everything in the list map or set literal, not not just a list. You break it down to three cases. You have to take care of unnecessary cons in front of an object and unnecessary cons in front of a list, wait, yeah, in front of a list and in front of a set or a map. So in the Dart language, a set or a map, they share the same structure. So in the ASD, they, they can't really differentiate between a uh, set or a map. So we have the same test for that. So then the question comes, what about the rest of these the different cases? All the other cases are covered by, all these cases are covered by um, just lists, set maps and objects. There's other stuff, but I think in the interest of time, I won't, I won't explain why, let's say things are literal numbers. They, are, they will never ever need to, they will never ever have like cons in front of it. Oh, I think I put this here actually. Yeah, sorry. So you have these three things, instance creation, expression, set literal, list, list literal. This is also a map literal, by the way. So these three things are things we want to watch out for. As for this, uh, formally inside the Dart API, we call this an instance creation expression. What this really is, is, is just a different way to say this is uh, us creating object, calling a constructor. And you have other, we need, we need to make sure other literals don't have the cons keyword in front, but because the, the other literals don't seem to support cons at all, there's no need to set up a linter to deal with this because they, they just can't, accept the const word at all. Like you, you probably would fail during the compilation process. You try to put like const two or const uh, true. Okay. So we talk about AST and we talk about how a linter use AST. I'm slowing down now deliberately because I think this might be a bit complicated, uh, a bit more abstract for some people, not for some, for, for everyone. So simple AST visitor class underscore visitor Essentially, we're using an AST visitor to visit each node within an AST to figure out if, hey, this node, this isn't creation expression. Does it violate the, the lint? 
or to concretize it or to ground it in what we discussed, does this constructed call, is this constructed call made inside constant context where it doesn't need the const? Is this list literal call, sorry, is this list, list literal uh, written in a context where it doesn't need a const? Is this set of map literal written in a context where it doesn't need a const? Uh, I skipped through a few steps here in, in the interest of time, but uh, if you look at the API for simple AST visitor, the, the three nodes, so we talk about AST, abstract syntax tree, so every single, so a tree is made of multiple nodes, right? So the nodes are all the different children in a tree. So the nodes we want to visit are this tree, and these are the three nodes that are visible, <coughs> sorry, that are provided by the, by the dot API. Whoops, sorry. So you do, you, you essentially want to make sure that your, your node keyword, <coughs> sorry, let me drink some water. Choking a bit because I would really love to show you guys this uh, by coding in life, but because I need to recompile the SDK each time, it's just not uh, feasible. So when you visit your instance creation expression or your constructor call, if your node doesn't have a const keyword, there's no need to report a lint, right? Because unless because here's because here's what I want to do. You want to make sure you have no unnecessary const. If whatever you visit doesn't have the const keyword, this is guaranteed that you don't need to report it. So otherwise you report this. So this is our first step. We, let's try and do this and see what happens. So you're gonna have lints firing on all these statements. So what we see is cons uh, a, sorry, cons a bracket, which means that the, the, the constructor call or the instance creation expression has a cons, therefore we're linting. This is exactly why it says, don't lint if it has cons, otherwise lint. So this means lint if it has cons. So every single constructor expression, uh, sorry, instance creation expression with a cons are linted. So while this works for, for let's say cases here, where you have, a, you have a cons for your constructor and also cons for a variable, thereby making the, the cons unnecessary. You also have false positives where, your, where you do need the cons for your constructor because your left-hand side doesn't have cons. So this is not a constant context, but the line below is a constant context because once you declare cons here, everything on the right has a context that, yeah, you know what, I need to be cons. So there's no need to be that declaration. So we need to further specify a, another condition in order to make our lint work. And in this case, you need to specify that this lint should only fire if one. First condition, I have a cons keyword. Sorry, I have a cons keyword. And second condition, I have a cons keyword and I'm inside a constant context. So that's pretty uh, straightforward. You just write a note dot in constant context. This is super duper easy because the linter has all this information available. And then, so, and then uh, pretty much this thing just says, if my node doesn't have a cons or if my node is not constant context, do nothing, it's fine. Like this is, this is a completely valid expression. Otherwise it's invalid and report the lint. So we're going to, uh, so everything red means that it's linting, everything blue means it is not linting, but we need a lint. So as you can see here, the, the reason why your, the reason why this lint doesn't fire is because A has cons, but A is not in constant context. However, your list literal is in constant context because A is in, because A is cons, and therefore you don't need the cons for your list. Same for your map map or set. <coughs> and that's the same for this as well. So this is pretty simple. And you note that your, your list literal and your set of map literal has a, has a super class, which is type literal. So the type literal, uh, so you can pretty much write the same method for both of this, these, uh, these methods. Sorry, you can pretty much just have the same logic to visit both your set or map literal or and your list literal. So it's the same logic as this. If your node has a, if your node, sorry, this is a bit tricky because I keep inverting the logic. The, the most straightforward way to say this is, 
if your node has a const keyword and it's a constant context, report your lint. Uh, sorry, report this node to the linter. Otherwise, don't report. And there you have it. Uh, this would pretty much make the, it, this is pretty much all you need in order to lint out unnecessary cons in your project. Uh, I think I spoke for a lot. I'm pretty sure that at some places I'm not that clear. Um, it seems like we are at 30 minutes, so it, it's about time for questions. So uh, does anyone have any questions or have I kind of lost everyone here? Okay, cool. seems like no one has any questions for, uh, for this. So what I, oh, I still have some other stuff. So what I hope that I've able to show you is how easy it is to write lens and when you should consider writing lens. I would love to get super technical on this, but unfortunately this is not my forte and I don't want to teach things that I don't know super duper in depth. Uh, like Junior has a lot of experience. I'm pretty sure he's like the, the guy to go to for quantum quantum stuff, but I, I'm like not the guy to go to for this. Uh, this are the last slide here. It basically is the rest of the boilerplate code to write your lint. So you still need to declare a, a lint rule and say that this, well, it essentially dictate whether this this lint is a lint for styles, a lint uh, that should result in an error. Basically, a severity of lint. Basically, a severity of lint, so people know how to deal with it. And this is um, just telling the, the lint rule that it needs to know of these three nodes instant creation expression, this literal, or circle map literal. Okay. So that is it. Uh, if you have no questions, I'm going to hand it back to Jivesh. Yeah, Jivesh. Uh, Jeff, do you want to, um, if there's no questions now, do you want to go through um, the, the lint stuff that you had mentioned earlier that you can go through if you have more time? Yeah. So I think maybe what's more useful for everyone here, if you are interested in lint specifically for that, would be, uh, can you see this? Can you see this page? Customizing static analysis. Yep. So, okay, cool. Thanks. So this is just, I think a pretty into it, a pretty well-written documentation, how you can customize static analysis for your project. Uh, I, I feel like most people have dealt with demo files or demo files should be quite re relatively straightforward to, to look at. So this is a sample analysis, analysis option file. As long as you dump it somewhere in your project, your dot your Dart linter should pick up these rules and they would basically follow what your YAML file says and just linting. So let's say you want to you want to lint for unnecessary cons, right? So you just add a new line here, write unnecessary cons, and simple as that, your linter is going to pick it up. So the reason for this is because all, all the lints are included in the lint. Dot rules. All the rules are pretty much, I think. Wait, is this the right one? Cat move. Hmm. Sorry, this one. They're included within the rules. So your project already has them. And as far as I know, there's no way for you to uh, take in any custom rules. So there's no need for you to like include any other packages, as long as, as you specify the, the rules, you're bound to have it. Uh, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. Like this is pretty much all, all you need to know to, to set up links in your project. And I think the cool stuff is you can have multiple YAML files, which means that based on the, which subdirectory your project lives in, you can have different rules. So this is used, super duper useful if you want to, customize your, if, if a certain sub team have a more strict coding style than the general team, and you only want to subject that small team to this course, uh, this different, uh, sorry, to a stricter code style list. I think the rest of this just gives you information on how you want to enable and disable the, the different rules. Uh, excluding, excluding files, suppressing rules for a file, 
these are the rest of this are just configuration, like more advanced configuration or like more fine, more configuration lets you fine tune the behavior of your net. And I think changing the severity of rules is probably the more, I would say, useful one. So depending on the severity of your rules, like info warning or error, uh, I think a few different things can happen to your project. You could configure some CICD that says if there are warnings, uh, don't let this pull request uh, merge. So, so, so that I think that uh, severity level or that what's the, yeah that severity level is pretty important uh, where you want to automate not put automate gatekeeping certain certain PRs if they have uh, if they violate rules. Sorry, if it violate lint rules. And the severity level is, yeah, I think I, I kind of am being a day horse at, at this point. Yeah, I think it's quite self, self explanatory that different severity rules is used to communicate this information and you can customize your CI CD to act reactively to this different severity. Yeah. Okay, I think that's pretty much it actually. I see a question discuss why we need to check what necessary cause. Okay, so Ryan Matthews asked why do you check for unnecessary constants in the code? Uh, so this is a style lint, right? Which means that it is opinion, is in some sense opinionated. The reason why you, you do want to check for this is, I think my understanding of this is if you have more things to read and you have cons popping out everywhere, it's redundant information. You don't really need this information. So you could, you could might as well do without. And for that reason, it is preferable that you don't have unnecessary cons. You only have one cons uh, in your, you only have one cons that puts the rest of your expression inside constant context, and that's good enough. Does that answer your question? If it doesn't, please uh, ask me again, in case I misunderstood the intention of your question. Discuss about the There's also a question from Jishnu. Um, I can just read it out. Um, so he asked, uh, you discussed the part of the linter that finds situations that indicate errors, but many linters also recommend changes. So could you talk a bit about that as well, whether it's implemented in the same place as the, in the compile process? So that bit is uh, implemented in a Dart Analyzer plugin. It is uh, not in the same place as the linter for Dart. Uh, this plugin, Where is contribution contributing? It's not this one. Is it read? I'm not sure where the where the markdown file is, but from my understanding uh, of this, the last time I read it, this is not part of the the fixing. Bit is not part of the compilation process. It's part of the analyzer plugin, which is then used by IDEs like Android Studio, VS Code, in order to recommend changes. So it is not implemented in the same place as the compile process. Why well, need to check for uh, maybe cost increase compiled binary size? Uh, I'm not too sure about that actually. I would assume that if the compiler can so I'm just speculating. I have no idea how this is implemented in that. Uh, that's potential. That's possibly one reason. However, I would think that if your compiler can figure out where the cons are unnecessary or not, it probably would also omit this unnecessary cons during the compilation time. So you don't have that in your binary. So that date code in a way just eliminated. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Actually, Jeff, about the about the the thing about recommending changes, um, like do lint rules in Dart support that as well? I think lint rules in Dart. This I'm not too sure. I would think probably not, because I think the the place that's implemented is the place that where it's implemented is within the is within the analyzer package. 
Like that's just my guess because I have not went I have not went through that. I have not recommended changes while developing a lint rule yet. The only place which I see uh which I see. So when when I was making all these changes, the only place where I see it saying write this bit if you code here, you don't recommend changes was inside the analyzer. I would want to find that readme actually. I think it would probably explain like answer Jishnu's question a lot better. Dot is using dot doing that ways can contribute. Yeah, unfortunately, I really can't think of where this is off the top of my head. Constructor tells no, this is just um updates. Yeah, sorry. I would say I don't really know my, but my guess is that it is implemented on the analyzer plugin side, which is a different package than the lint than the linter package. This one, I think. Comes uh, with the dot SDK, the the linter package is somewhat slightly more removed. Yeah, and can be isolated. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, if there's any other questions, um, yeah, please do post them on the chat. Actually, uh, can I ask, like, given that the, I mean, given that the point of link rules is to often like specify, um, or at least when I've encountered link rules, it's mostly to specify like particular coding conventions, um, in particular projects. Um, so like, given that, why is the process to sort of implement your own link rules and like implement your own own style links, for example, um, why is it like like you described it as being quite difficult? So. Is that like intentional or why is it so? Is that uh, in relation to us not being able to write custom lint rules in Dart? Mm. Yeah. Oh, so I think that's just a, again, I'm, I'm not from the Dart team, so I'm not too sure. But my best guess is it's probably because of the way that uh, the compilation process is designed such that it doesn't pick up additional lint rules post compilation of the SDK. It is also possible that in order for it to know, okay, so I think one, one of the, the questions that you can illustrate this, uh, this complexity would be uh, how do lint rules lint themselves? Because when inside that, if you have a lint rule, that lint rule is also able to, to lint it its own file, which means that you would, in order for this feature to be active, you need to be able to have compiled the lint rule into the SDK before even uh, open the, the, the file that contains the lint rule. So I would say this might just be due to the way that they have designed the, they have designed the compilation process for the DAI SDK. And it should be easier in other, other languages where they want their developers to write their own lint rules. Does this make sense? Or am I not really answering the question? I mean, that's fair. Yeah, I didn't think about the lint rules needing to lint themselves. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, if there's, if there's no other questions, I mean, uh, if there's anything else you want to demo or go through given more time, um, please, uh, like, yeah, please feel free. Oh no, uh, I would say that I try to keep it as short as possible because I'm not too sure if this is an area that is too relevant for people seeing that how, uh, I mean, as a student, I didn't have that much experience with, with projects. So, me, so I would imagine in my own shoes, this would be something that uh, is hard for me to really appreciate due to not having to deal with like people paying me and like, hey, why can't I push this code in? Uh, what's the reason for not being pushed to code? Can you explain stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. thanks so much for all the questions and for having me. Okay, that's fair. Um, then sure, like in that case, we can end the talk uh, early. Um, yeah, I think, uh, thanks so much for coming down, Jeff. This is a fun walkthrough of lending and the rules. So yeah, thanks. Um, if, if there's any questions, I'll still keep 
the call open until like 6 50 um and then close it then but thanks so much uh, thanks everyone for coming down especially given that it's a friday evening it's a pretty like this is peak dinner timing uh and it's weekend for the people in uni so yeah thanks for coming down um i hope it was fun for you all and for the speaker as well um and yeah that's it from us um thanks bye thanks for organizing this have a good weekend everyone